HiSec buyback offers 90% GDA anywhere in HiSec. Simply go to HiSec.EveBuyback.com, appraise your items, create a contract, and get paid quickly. Welcome to Talking in Stations, a podcast about EVE Online. I am Matterall, here with some friends. I want you to meet Ash Dorothy. Greetings, fellow Empyreans. I am Ash Dorothy, and I'm having a good weekend. How are you guys doing? We're good. Uh, apparently, you are being evicted from your wormhole. We'll talk about that as one of our topics today. Good luck. I, I prefer to say that I'm throwing a party. I like that. So, also with us today is Sahara Jackal. How are you doing, Sahara? I'm doing very well. Hi, everyone. I'm the CEO of Strybog Clade, and uh, I'm evicting Asherathi from his wormhole <laughs> along with some friends. An RSVP <laughs> attendant, as it, as it were. Yes, yes, yes. So, so, a party thrower and a party goer. Okay. Woo! And lastly, we have Uriel. He's a new face around talking in stations, having some great conversations with him. How are you doing, Uriel? I am doing great. Tell us a little bit about your game. Mostly just almost all in low sec, going around in a blockade runner, just having fun, avoiding <laughs> smart bomb gates now, and just protecting my assets and making money that way. Right. So you're the, uh, again, legitimate PVP, or you're the fox and the hound. You're the fox yeah. and the fox and the hound. Yeah. yeah. Fox and the hound's gameplay. I like to say the best PVP, -er, because again, player versus player is also evasive maneuvers. But the best PVP -er in EVE Online is Katya Se, who managed to go to every system, uh, wormhole or not, in EVE Online without getting killed. There's no oh, better I... record than that. I love the reply that they gave in Twit. No, it was on uh, Twitter, yeah, where they were like, people were giving threats and they were like, bring it on, and just went ahead and did it. What? What? <laughs> I am so confused right now. Yeah, I, I missed that. All right. We'll edit that out. Uh, I'm just kidding. All right, thanks. That is the uh, group that's with us today. Let's go to our first story of the day, and that is Ashtarothi's uh, party. How's it going? Yeah. So we occupied the wormhole of, which, what is it even now? J150745, about a year ago, just as an opportunity for reactions and to get new bros to dip their toes into faction wor or in, uh, wormholes. And uh, starting last Wednesday, we were going to do we were doing our last moon pop now that the compression changes has made it so that mining in wormhole space is not essential and a bunch of people a bunch of my old friends from all sorts of you know years past decided to show up and you know help me with the decommissioning of my structures what they're moving your couch and stuff <laughs> Yes. Uh, removing my couch. For sure. Yeah. Moving exactly. couches with extreme prejudice. That's right. <laughs> I put out pizza and beer. It's great. Yeah, he uh, had he had the, the police drop by actually, the wormhole police, who are one of <laughs> one of the entities that are, are doing the eviction. And I I have to laugh at Vinegar's videos are so funny. Is the wormhole police and, and RPing the whole police department and I was told I was told now, you know, I'm just just going on what, you know, police authorities tell me for the wormhole police that there was an unpaid littering fine. And that was what got them involved in all of this. Apparently, they littered right. a bunch of structures in a wormhole. Oh, it's all those space. <laughs> no. floating so, around. Right. so the supposed littering, by the way, was that during invasions, there was an MTU that was left out and they found it. Oh, see, that's how they get you. That's how they get yeah. you. Yeah, I don't recognize their authority though, so that's one fine. of those. We're one of those sovereign citizen guys, right? <laughs> no, it's just their authority is is not recognized by anywhere. <laughs> All of the things that they cite are complete bogus. It's fine. All right, All right Ash. I mean, you're putting a good face on it, but basically, your wormhole explorations, your station there is being attacked and is going to be removed by enemies of yours. Including right. uh, Strybog, which Sahara is from. Strybog, Wormhole Police, Kaldari Militia, and Amar Militia. 
All right, these are guys. These are guys that grouped up because they specifically don't like you. Right. Well, so Gosh, uh, if you remember, there. Let me say that, but yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, basically. Yeah. So about hard. six months ago, if you remember, there was the big betrayal where people like stole all of uh, COE stuff. Well, they have continued to have a thing about it, and so I believe that, that there's been some coordination between the different people that they know don't like me. Well, yeah, the coordination is, um, hey, have you been, <laughs> you don't like Ashtarothi, right? No, I don't like Ashtarothi. Well, let's go beat him up in his wormhole, right? Yeah, let's go do that. That That's the coordination there. It's like an old, it's an old school, good old fashioned Eve grudge mat. But his name has- Maybe rally up. is a good word instead. Yeah. Oh, what, has his that? name come up as the target or is it- Oh yeah! Oh no, must, no, must be. Is... he's the common denominator, right? Uh, like... Yeah, the absolute, absolute common denominator. So our, uh, I, I call us and jokingly refer to us as the plaintiffs coalition. And uh, <laughs> wow, <laughs> <laughs> we we all have a we're we're, we're uh, taking him to court on on uh, matters court. of in, yeah space court right space and, court in Eve Online space court is settled through guns guns and missiles and and lasers so. Yeah, but the coalition, I mean, obviously, Cal Mill and Amar Mill, I mean, Astarothi's natural enemy, right? Due to his, yeah. you know, his leadership of Aderon Robotics, major player in the in the Galente militia, always has been. So natural enemies are showing up because, hey, why not? You know, this is an extension of faction warfare. It just happens to be in, in wormhole space. But then there's, you know, other groups, wormhole police as well, which are, like I say, you know, <clears throat> littering fine there too, but and Strybog Clade and other members of Pochman Group. So our beef, just to just that's the one that I know the most about. Our beef is that back in the invasions, Astrothi, and to his credit, was a major organizer of the Triglavian, you know, pro Triglavian factions back in 2020. And he founded Kybernauts Clade, which still exists today. But the beef that that Kybernauts have is that the idea was that we would contribute the loot that we got from from pushing system. And in general, the practice was to turn that over to Ashtarothi. And the promise was, we'll turn this into SRP or make pe make sure people get paid, you know, distributed equally. And uh, this is this actually predates my time for the most part in the in the Kybernaut scene. But the allegation is among the plaintiffs that. Uh, Ashtarothi took all that money that everyone handed to him in the Kybernauts and did not pay SRP and embezzled all that money. Mm. So there's three <laughs> points to that. First of all, I'm still friends with Kybernauts, including the Kybernauts CEO, so that's a little bit confusing. Second of all, I didn't actually found the Kybernauts. The current Kybernauts CEO founded it and then asked me to be in that position for uh, during yeah, invasions. Fair yeah, Opus. And Thirdly, I actually, so what actually happened was, just prior to invenge, invasions, a friend of mine who was a whale quit the game and gave me 150 billion isk. So I used that isk to, to buy all of the stuff. So at, at, after every invasion, they would contract me all of the stuff for a price, and I would just pay them that price, all of the FCs or you know whoever the FCs were, and I was coordinating with them. As far as the RCRP goes, I, what I was trying to do was provide free ships for everybody as a way of taking care of it. Ultimately, people didn't want to use it, so I just gave the free ships to the FC and got out of the way. I was AFK a lot. So I don't understand the whole like stealing ISK thing because I literally gave up 50 billion ISK during that time. But people like to say these things. Creative I accounts. Hate, creative accounts. I, I hate to be that guy, but do you have the receipts? Uh... <laughs> I mean, I could go back through it if you, but. Well, that, that that apparently is the other the other part because it's not just the you know the Kybernauts. The, there's also a number of ex Malro directors from Convocation of Empyreans who are also part of this coalition and and you know organized it now affiliated with Wormhole Police and other groups that have a, a major have a major beef that you know money was going missing from Convocation of Empyreans. There was a lack of transparency and in accounting, etc. And uh, have some very, very strongly felt grudge now against Ashtarothi and the current convocation of Imperium's leadership. 
So this no, one actually ticks one. me off. Go ahead. This one actually ticks me off because they're fucking liars. Oh, all right? wait. Whoa. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. Ooh. Sorry. No, they are absolutely liars. They're accusing me of stealing from Convocation of Empyreans when they're the ones that stole the ISK, and now they're trying to claim that it's me. I have my evidence. I'm still with the Convocation of Empyreans and giving up my ISK to replace the shit that they stole. All right. That's uh, acceptable. What's the th is there more more allegations? I think I think that, that's that it. Pretty much settles Basically. the four teams. <laughs> yeah, we're we're uh, th this is so an this... anti embezzlement action under we're... Title 18 of the of the uh, Eve Space Code. There was another strange uh, argument that was made to me yesterday, the day before, which is that Cal Mills upset at me for working with Snuff, which I found really funny because <laughs> just the idea of me working with Snuff was really funny. It's you, it's almost you. Uh, not fighting, uh, what is it? You not holding snuff back because they kind of have their way. You just kind of. Uh, well, so, okay. Basically, like back in the day, I'm not going to go into the whole history of faction warfare, but our draw for a long time was very close allies, if not an alt corp of snuff. And our draw was in faction warfare. So there's always been a relationship between Galente Militia and faction warfare. But the idea that like, the Galente militia, a militia are sometimes working with snuff to this day, is my fault, is absolutely mind-boggling. Well, I'm, I'm having a hard time keeping up here. So, so there, there was there, there definitely no relationship with snuff, but there's been a long-time relationship with snuff. Like, Galente yeah. Mill has had a what relationship with snuff. On? I okay. personally have Galente been... Galente militia. Galente militia. Oh, okay. and harassed okay. by snuff for a long time. I have been they've, been... they've had a friendship with snuff in spite of me, not because of me. Oh, okay. So he's not the linchpin of it, but he belonged to the group that was working with Snuff. And I remember those days. That was about three years ago, wasn't it? Well, from my understanding, they're, they're, like, they've started working together again because Gal Mill's on the back foot. But mm. again, I've been mostly out of the picture there. Yeah. And I think Snuff was working with CVA. This is really interesting who Snuff works with, actually. Well, uh, I think it's fair to say that Snuff works with anybody that provides content, right? Because they're all about content. And I, find, I actually find that respectable. Now, they make a lot of people mad, but, you know, they're, they're really just all about spaceship explosions. Uh, they're literally sandcast kickers. Uh, sandcastle kickers, I guess. <laughs> but, okay, so you're, you're wrapped up in this. Ash, the reason I wanted to ask that question and get it out there is because you're the common denominator in why people are coming to attack, but you're also a very well-known EVE Online personality because you did a lot of podcasts before with, what is it, Low Drag and, or High Drag. Yeah, and also, of course, you were the lead host on Hydrostatic Podcast, one of the best podcasts in EVE's history. And then you've just been around, just around doing your stuff on your channel and that sort of stuff. So, Right. What? My major focus is on uh, maximizing player with EVE, uh, players' engagement with EVE Online and putting EVE into context for people. So, you know, when things happen, I tell people the, I talk about the history and what I think might be the broader implications of something. And the embezzlement just comes af naturally as a part of that, right? I, okay. <laughs> So hold on. <laughs> let, me, let, me ask every, let me ask everybody a question. Let me ask everybody a question. If you have a major alliance with over a thousand people, do you would you consider it to be unusual for the alliance alliance like leader to hold a fair chunk of the assets on their personal character so it can't be stolen? I would find that very unusual. Interesting. Okay. But that I was, mean, I mean, that's ultimately the accusation. But I would argue that. The fact that all of it immediately got stolen was a really good indicator that I was right. Uh, all I so all I know is that uh, I mean, Strybog Clay, uh, indirectly, you are responsible for for the fact that I you know have a space job now, and so thank you first of all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm uh, happy to make everybody's content. By the way, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you provide so job, right? Uh, for so many people. Yeah, this our our, our alliance formed out of anger over over what happened with Kybernauts and the you know misappropriation of funds so there were three people who were who were in Kybernauts and who got quite upset about this and Taylor who were their were their names and uh, they founded Strybog Clade and they they named Strybog 
after the Slavic god of wind and wealth distribution and rule number one, and the only thing that you can get permanently blacklisted from our from our alliance for is failure to pay, you know, failure to pay the your your people. So w- we have we we have oh. like ris- ridiculously transparent finances and and uh, where everything goes because that's sort of the, the whole the whole purpose for our existence. And uh, so so yeah, when when you say, you know, is it is it strange that an alliance CEO would, you know, hold all of a an alliance's assets on their person? Yeah, I find that very strange and and I would be alarmed as a as a line member, I would question a alliance that had that that had that in operation because that to well, me is just a, is just asking for to never leave anything exposed that you don't have to. To be fair, though, how has this corporation come about and been structured? Is it like your typical early Eve cult of personality, or is this more professional, like in-game, trying to get objectives done? Because that's going to dictate how a lot of that is. I mean, between those two options, I would say cult of personality. Like, we don't actually have, like, our objective is maximizing player engagement with Eve Online. Like, it's designed to just be a place for high sec. So, I mean, like, we've had taxes and stuff. But ultimately, a lot of our stuff goes to like paying for our structures and whatnot. So building up our BPO library, you know, the stuff that got stolen. But we're, we're, we're I mean, we're still rebuilding and stuff. But Well, the, sec- the, security, uh, the security of assets in group play is very difficult in EVE Online. Maybe it's gotten better with access lists. But before that, you had to lock hangers and give access and that sort of stuff. So one of the things that, at least a long time ago, that groups would do is they wouldn't even have communal equipment. They wouldn't even have communal money. Everybody was just kind of their own bank and stuff. But people want to play together. People want to earn together, that sort of thing. It gets complicated. And for the record, I revealed my API access to the directors. They're able to look at stuff. The issue was is that I was being accused of like not being able to account for every single penny when in fact nobody else had to contribute anything and I was, you know, funding everything. The concern was that there wouldn't be enough funding, you know, a lot of pearl cl- clutching. And ultimately I said, you know, the reason why I I have the my chunk of the stuff, you know, the operational money is out there in the corporation. There's like 90 billion s worth of stuff within the corporation. I know that because that's how much got stolen. But like the rest of it, I can assure you it's, it's there and I showed people the numbers, but they, my, I, my theory is that they already had made the decision of what they wanted to do yep. and what they were that's trying right. to do is get me to expose more stuff. Oh, oh, okay. Well, that's even uh, sneakier than I thought. I figured they need a reason to do something and this is, this is part of it. You're... But I, I like it. I mean, that's this this part of what Eve Online is. It's narratives, narratives to uh, make things happen. Oh yeah, this is the best thing. Like, who yeah. doesn't love a good old fashioned grudge match? I mean, <laughs> let, it's let even more honest. confusing. By the way, the person in yeah. the chat that's currently talking smack, he also, of all the people, he was the one that got accused of embezzling money out because he was running the, uh, the wrecking machine project. So, it seems a little bit odd. Yeah. They're piling on, but okay. So those are the reasons, and and you know there's there's a lot of there's a lot of fun to it, but there's also a lot of there's a narrative to it, a story, and some actual grudges. I love the Strybog is transparent and abhorrent, you know, hoarding of wealth, that sort of thing. And so that's part of your motivation. That's great. That's right. We we firmly believe in fully automated luxury gay space communism in uh, in Potchman. <laughs> And uh, we are strong believers in that, and we, we have very strict accountancy accountancy rules and regulations, more so it. than and, even the, the big three. And you're willing to call the, the uh, space police. That's right. <laughs> we will call, right, right. The, the space police, that's our FBI. We're the DOJ. Gotcha. Okay. And there's also, we put a poll out to the uh, people watching, and it says, do you recognize the validity of wormhole space police? And uh, this is put out by Araya. And uh, that looks like it's completely in thirds. So, yes, you are legit. No way. And uh, what's a wormhole? I'm going to call him out. Uh, In the main thread about me, 
the wormhole release made a couple months ago, I went back and forth with the leader about their, you know, rights to do it because it was all an RP because it was an RP th thread. Until he just decided to stop responding to me, and when I went to go look again, he scrubbed my information out of his side of the com like putting me as the wanted list. But even more interestingly, I put a comment on his last video because like there's some factually wrong things and he's using old kill mails to try to show something off. He deleted my comment in less than two minutes. So I mean like kind of a chump move. Kind of a chump <laughs> move. Kind of a cowardly move. I would okay. say. Wow. All right. So there's some real heat under this party that you're well, having. Well, there's at least some whining. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so but what's yeah. going to happen, Ash? What's going to happen? Well, I, I mean, the, the main Sorry, event, Sarah. I think, was yesterday. Uh, the, that was the, the no, major. The, there were four structures total. The two big off. ones were yesterday. Those got blown up. There's two smaller, you know, less, less critical structures in today. And, uh, but yeah, so I guess, it, I guess Ash is inviting everybody to come in on the kill mail. Yeah, so we have a we have a channel called Sync Atlantis, where we're maintaining our static information for anybody who wants to come and join. And Atlantis is the name of your wormhole system. Correct. A nickname. Yeah, I mean Atlantis is designed to sink and rise again. That's like its entire function. Oh, I like that. And this is you use this to train, right? Like to get out there and explore and train and that sort of thing. Yeah, basic reactions in, in industry, and then also to get people out of the idea that wormhole place, uh, space is that spooky. Right. Kinda, uh... It's spooky, but it's spooky fun. <laughs> right. Okay, so good luck. So the majority of the fighting was done yesterday. And uh, when is the loot phase? When should people show up to get their door prize? Oh, Lord. It, the looting went on for so long yesterday. There, there was so much stuff in there. Oh, the two Bill Legion. That was my, that was my favorite find. That was, uh, yeah, dead spaced out Legion. Pretty, pretty hot. I don't know who that belonged wow. to, but thank you. Was that and, one of your cars, Ash? Nope. Every, you don't, everybody, you don't drive who, that, right? everybody who's been around got their stuff out. Mm -hmm. So anything that dropped would have had to been somebody who's been like AFK or not paying attention for the last week. Maybe some of the same guys attacking you. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, ironically enough, we did see kill mails for Corvettes and stuff still owned by the person in chat right now. <laughs> All right. Well, Ash, do you have anything else you want to say about the Atlantis thing? Everything working out? It will rise again, obviously. Yeah. I mean, I, it... It was very impressive, the force that was arrayed before us. I will thank as many people, as many groups that were there to hate on me. There were like twice as many groups in the background that was giving, you know, giving support in one way or another and willing to show support. So it, it was a lot of fun. We had a, a relatively decent fight on Thursday, I want to say. But, you know, it's, it's been a very exciting thing on both sides. And so I'm not necessarily discouraged. And I think that there is a lot of cool stuff to go forward. No, I'll say that's true. And I, I mean, let's be honest, like structure bashing is, is cancerous. It's, it is so boring, right? To you know, <laughs> bash structures, bashing pokos, blah, blah, blah. Honestly. You need a good grudge match motivation to get people's butts oh, yeah. into ships and to say, hey, let's come find a wormhole and let's get there way early just in case and to, so we can maintain hole control and, and then let's bash a structure and, and then let's, let's you know, find a way to haul all the loot back to staging and stuff like that. That's just time consuming and, and a lot of it is, is uh, more mundane and not as exciting. But when there's a good story behind it, when there's a good... You know, this is the reason a good grudge match behind everything. That's like peak Eve. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we what? we had gotten together like 40, 50 people to like form a defense. And with most evictions, I was like, this is going to be a pretty good time. And we can like bring in some extra people. And then they showed up with like 80. And I was like, oh, OK, <laughs> fair enough. Yeah. 
I think you're absolutely right on that. And you, you need good stories. This is what the, it's a story driven game about players colliding into players or evading players. And it's just great that you can do it with such class, Sahara. Like it's, it's fun. It's light. It's meaningful, but it doesn't have to get ugly, you know, and Ash, you're, you know, you're too popular not to be, you know, ha having people have an agenda against you. It's just, it's a fact of being as hi highly visible as you are and for as long as you have been and oh. for doing the kind of thing that you're doing, which is training up new players and stuff like that. Matter all, if I, am I, there was a question in chat about what we're doing with all of the loot. So all of the groups kind of got together and decided that we're taking all the loot, going to sell it, and then take it and donate it to Plex for Good, since that event is Love going it. On. Oh, well, I would have taken out a lot less stuff if I knew that that was what was going to happen. Do <laughs> <laughs> You are welcome right. to come in and, and bring in a lot of... I've been told, I have on good authority, that if you contract it to me, I'll pay you for it. Definitely well, trust you with that, Ashtarabi. <laughs> All right, so so that's the that's the sinking of Atlantis. Uh, the party just happened. Speaking of Plex for good, that is, we're going to talk about that in just a minute when we go into game news. But this is a player driven, a player thing that somebody I think he still wants to be anonymous, but we'll probably talk about this later on. Is doing a matching fund up to two hundred billion for uh, Plex for good for his, uh, I think for his corporation or alliance. And so that got us thinking that we should do a matching fund as well. So we're trying to figure out how best to do that, how best to see. I think if you give Plex up, you give it through contract, right? So you would have a receipt of that, right? Yes, you contract it? it to the character Plex for good. There's instructions. Right. That's how you give to this uh, charity. And uh, I just love the idea that a player is, you know, basically creating a giant fund. I'll talk to him again. I think he's willing to also do it for talking in stations. In other words, whatever people give to Plex for good, he'll give the same amount and match your funds, which is a really nice way to get the numbers up for these events. Plex for good. We'll talk about in just a second and more information on that in a minute. But first, more player news. In it, Kiki Fleet, that's the initiative, got tackled in horde ratting, uh, sorry, got tackled on a horde ratting super called Snuff Dreads to secure the kill. Panfam drops super fleet to kill the dreads. We have the kill mail up now. This happened about six hours ago. And it looks, like, looks a like bloody brawl. Yeah, it's 250 billion isk lost in this fight. 200. 30, but that is a pretty big fight. So it's Pandemic Horde against Snuffed Out. Those guys don't like each other. Speaking of Snuffed Out, Pandemic Horde and Snuff, enemies for many years now. We have Northern Coalition helping out uh, their ally, Pandemic Horde. On the other side, you have the Initiative and Fraternity, which is interesting because Horde and Fraternity are on good are on good standing, but in this case, very few fraternity, fraternity and snuff have worked, have not worked together. So I don't know why they're actually there. They, fraternity and snuff also have a rivalry. So uh, I don't know what that, that group's there. Maybe they're in the wrong column, actually. It looks like no super was destroyed. Again, this is snuff with their dreads. I remember it in, they did the same thing in fraternity space not that long ago, about a month ago. And they got in there and they, they killed a few things. They killed, I think, two maybe two Titans and a Super, something like that. But they ended up getting their Dreadnought fleet stuck. And that lasted for at least a few weeks. And I don't know how many were killed trying to exit that situation. But here they are again, snuffed with a Dread Bomb is a, a big group of dreadnoughts going in and trying to kill uh, big ships. This time it cost them 133 billion. So Okay, thanks. Pandemic Horde did lose a couple nixes. So, yeah, they uh, 
looks like Snuff got something out of it. Although I don't know if that's enough to overcome. It's not enough to overcome all the dread losses. But yeah, I don't think that they're, they will be happy with this result for sure. Yeah. Well, maybe this is a sign that the changes coming to industry are easing up people's desire to use dread bombs. I don't know. Not necessarily, not necessarily good, but whatever. We can talk about industry changes later on <laughs> and if it's meaningful. Okay. I want to tell you one more thing about player news. The new Eden Traveler episode has arrived and uh, has, has been released. I believe this is the final episode of the series. And if you haven't seen these, you should. They, they take about 10 minutes each and they're really worth the time. But you want to see New Eden Travelers. This is a beautifully shot and beautifully scripted exploration of landmarks in EVE Online and some of the history behind them. This is put as, together. As you mentioned before, Kadi Asai is well known for having explored every single system in the game, including some systems that we literally can't access because CCP took them to Polaris after they'd successfully oh, gone Oh, I didn't else. know that. And then, of course, Mark726 runs the EVE Travel website where he has gone around and cataloged every single, or almost, you know, all lot, tons of landmarks within EVE. It's a great website. So these are two of the, like, absolute titans in, you know, knowledge of the EVE universe coming together to make a, a, a video series. Yeah. Exploration and... Uh... Obviously, go to that website. It's Eve Travel. Look it up. Uh, Eve, Eve Online, Eve Travel. And, and it's on actually, since, since I'm pimping it all out, uh, Mark726 also does a Eve Lore Survival Guide. I often am asked by people, like, where, where's one place where I can find the basics of Eve Lore? If you just go to the Eve Travel, there is a link for his Eve Survival Guide, which he keeps up to date and basically goes over all of the major factions and what's been going on and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, so those two guys, Katya and Mark, together, put together the travel series to take you around to show you uh, different landmarks, and you can travel there too. They tell you how to get there, they show you where it is on the map, uh, they tell you why it's special, and if uh, you want a companion for that, Mark's website will, will give you a list of basically all the landmarks, and he updates them, and he gives you their history, and so you find uh, a lot more significance than just uh, what EVE Online as a game provides. So there you go. Check that out. That's New Eden Travelers Inspirations. This is the third episode in the series. I believe it's the final episode. Look at all those, and you can find those on Katya Say YouTube. It, it's also oh, worth noting Two more that episodes are coming. Not, it's not the final episode. Two more episodes are coming. It, it is also worth noting that both of these people both Katia and Mark726 have their own landmark themselves. Katia Isai's statue is where she first oh, started. Yeah. Mark726 has, now has his, I think it's like a museum for, for Mr. Professor, or, and it's got a little docking bay. Like He actually has his own landmark that got added in during That's the last awesome. landmark phase. I didn't know that. That's awesome. Yeah, Katya actually was the first statue made after a player. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful statue. Uh, I think it's actually featured in this one near the end. But I didn't know Mark had... Yeah, I think I did hear about a museum. But I didn't put it together. That was Mark. That's great. Yeah, right. Eve Travel Agency. That's what it is. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> Love that. And All yeah, right. I can't remember what system it's in either, but it is like the system that Mark has you know declared as being his like home base before so yeah yeah that's cool great all right so that's player news for now we got some fighting got some partying and you got some exploring so game news let's move over to that in game news we stand together this came out a week ago this is basically a statement very well done Basically, it's the CCP's position on the Russian invasion of Ukraine and how they have players from both countries and they want to encourage peace, not war. A part of this is the Plex for Good, which is something that CCP as a company does 
when there is natural disaster, catastrophe, and in this case, war, and people are uh, hurting and they raise money, you can participate in this by buying Plex, and giving it over to CCP, and CCP will take the money equivalent and put it in a donation fund that goes to relief efforts. So that is Plex for good. <clears throat> and so now what we're trying to do, one of our Patreons is doing matching funds for his alliance. I believe he's also doing a 200 billion matching fund for TIS. And uh, we're asking CCP if there's a way somehow to, to create incentives to do matching funds. And if so, talking in stations would do their own matching fund if we can figure out how to do that. <laughs> but it seems like a really good way to use ISK and Plex inside the game. Speaking of incentives, past, I, I think every single past Plex for Good has had some sort of like reward afterwards, like a t-shirt or something. Uh, they haven't mentioned anything either way about it yet, but it, they could very well, you know, announce something about, along those lines as we go forward. So. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I've got several of the t-shirts from previous ones. Huh. I don't think I've gotten anything. <clears throat> hmm. All right, well. Ash, I have to make this joke. It just popped into my head, but you are using your Plex, right? Actually, so uh, we have a mining blitz going on right now as well in EVE, and that's pretty good ISK. So I plan on, now that, once the party's over and I can focus on other things, I'm probably going to have a day or two of mining blitz and then donate the you know, proceeds from that. Mining blitz, let's talk about this. This is the latest event in EVE Online. What is the mining blitz? Well, so in 2015, 2016, they came out with resource wars, but like the reward structure of resource wars was really dumb and... There's other problems like you needed to have stand, grind up standings to be able to do the higher tier sites and all sorts of stuff like that. But uh, last year for the Stargate Trailblazer event, we they brought back uh, Resource Wars sites for that, and it was really popular. So then during the each of the empires, during their empire day, the, that empire had their own Mining Blitz sites. That was also popular. And so then to celebrate... I guess all of this mining changes for one week. We have mining blitz sites again, and there is one constellation in high sec and one constellation in low sec for each of the four empires. That's important because which empire you do it for determines what rats you're going to have to face and also what LP you get and therefore what skins you're able to buy and what clothing you're able to buy from the, that LP. Awesome. You said something, these were. This was something that was in the game before it was pulled because they didn't calibrate the wards well enough. What were those things called? There were, so the original Resource Wars had Resource Volatile War. Skins as its main reward. And Volatile Skins were both killed when or lost when you died, but more importantly, were bind on pickup. So you couldn't actually sell them for anything, which made, which made it so then they had to... like. Ironically, to the modern day, they also had to sell fully fit ships on the LP store to make up for it. And it's just awful. Nobody liked to do it because of that. And, you know, people that do it now, I've, I've heard lots of people having lots of fun with it now that the rewards are fixed. But originally, people didn't do it because not only did you have to, like, work hard in order to get to that reward, but a lot of people had to work hard because this is not content that can really be multiboxed or anything like that. Like the highest tier stuff, which is where the real ISK is, takes seven people working together. Yeah. So have you uh, done any of this uh, event or anything? Are you busy? Mining event? Oh my yeah. God, I, I just <laughs> broke out in hives just thinking about it. Ew, ew. <laughs> Get that off me. Oh God. No, Wait, uh, no, in Mine fact, I joke. Popular. Okay, I used to I used to do mining back in the farms and fields days in Delve because I formerly was a goon, right? And and what do you do in Delve if, when you're a goon except own like a whole, you know, fleet of Rorquals and and mine stuff? But I gave all of that up. Rorquals. I sold all my Rorquals and oh. uh, 
and I, and I bought RP gear for my character instead, which was a definite trade up. So no, no mining, no oh, mining gosh. for this lady. What? <laughs> you're, you're done with that. I, I kind of feel like uh, yeah, you're slumming it, you know, you, you were living in the big house and then you moved into Poshman and decided to just decided to just dress in my, my Adidas and, uh, and yes. uh, squat like the uh, <laughs> like Poshman, like the Poshman, yeah, that, that I am. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's, right. Uh, That's right. But I'm I'm loving it, and I wouldn't I wouldn't have it any other way. No, it, it's been good. Like I've been playing now for just under five years or so, so I, I feel like I've gotten a chance to to get to know Nullsec. I've you know, derped around in high sec and now I'm doing, you know, wormholes a little bit and now I'm doing this Potchman thing. So it's sort of like the, the classic Eve, you know, try try a little of everything until you find something that you love and when you get bored of that, try something new. I love the depth that, that Eve has. Oh, Sarah, you make me want to move to Potchman and hang out with you there. I know I say that a lot because I keep, but I, reality Poshman. is I can't do it, but it just sounds so fun hanging out it with you. It is so much fun like this is what uh, you know people who dog on on Potchman and and i kind of got on on brisk and uh and merkel chen's case a little bit because you know they they've been you know kind of putting Potchman down and i i, I tried to, to make the case to them when they were streaming one well day they, they can't tax it so why would they like it exactly so they, they, <laughs> they can't control it you can't control it and you can't tax it unless of course you are you know the brilliant minds at castle kickers who learned how to tax it very early on and were were you know distressingly successful at taxing Potchman oh, wow. back in the, in the seagulling days. But uh, yeah, you can't control it. Can't tax it. But I, I, what I told them was like, look, the people you, you got to love Potchman. You got to support Potchman because the people who come here and live here and, and really make it home, they, they wake up every day, excited to play Eve and excited to log on. That is something that not a lot of other places in Eve can even pretend to say but we we absolutely love it and it has it has gotten significantly better over the last six months and i'm excited to see what you know what how it goes in the future yeah it's it seems like it's the most exciting part of the game right now is poshman my i think so i i unabashedly agree yeah like if i were a new player i was coming into the game i i what'd you call it i'd kick around high sec yeah, kick around uh, high sec for a little bit, and then and then go. it's it's a little rough though. If you if you're a low SP player, I mean, you got to have Omega because it's wormhole space. Cloak is mandatory for you know a lot of things. High skills. This is where you know a lot of deep pocketed players live. This is where people undock their blinged out battleships and marauders with all of the implants and all of the high level drugs. You know abyssal rolled uh you know abyssal rolled drugs. stuff and the, and the whole the whole thing yes high quality drugs you yeah know. right the pharmaceutical your, stuff right, right. Not your, the your, street your stuff. cocaine not your crack you know the, <laughs> the good the good stuff but seriously so but we still have we have newbies who you know come in and if they're up for the challenge and up for the frustration and and the unfairness of you know not no local got to learn how to de-scan, still get, you know, do everything right and still lose, you know, kind of a, kind of an environment. Yeah. Um, if they're really up for that, then, then they get trained really quickly into how to, how to PVP and Eve. And in my opinion, you come in with that as a new, as a new person, a new bro, you can handle anything that Eve throws at you forever afterwards. Ash, is this the Dark Souls part of Eve Online? Poshman? Oh boy. Well, I mean, I think I, you're previewing. You're spoilering. No, uh, I do want to actually talk and think about like the Eve being the Dark Souls of of MMOs. But I actually really like Potchfin for a few reasons. Most of all, that like in order to exist in Potchfin, the this most successful thing to do is to go native, right? Like. If you think about things, if you live as a Triglavian and you raid out for resources and bring it in and you extirpate all of the intruders of the Pochbin, like you are be being a Kybernaut, you're being pro Triglavian. Like it, it's it's a very interesting thing because like the Triglavians have this whole like glorification of the fit, mortification of the unfit, 
you know, proving survival of the fitness sort of mentality. And Pochvin reflects that mechanically so well. I think it's really, really clever. Yep, that's true. All right. Okay, so this is the mining event, though. Uh, let's go back to that. And CCP is pushing mining because they've made some changes to mining and they want people to get out there and participate in mining and seeing what it's like. We've talked plenty about the changes as they progress with uh, CSM member Kenneth, who was uh, walking us through a lot of the changes and explaining them. Kenneth and Artemis did an explainer video, or Kenneth and some friends, about what was in the patch notes. And you can check that out. That was a couple episodes ago. And <clears throat> let's go through that real quick. What, what were some of the big takeaways for you guys on the patch notes? Did you guys even well, There's even the compression know? changes. That yeah. was the big one. But you also see the, it's, it's been an interesting little rollout of a patch. You know, the, there was a lot of confusion, especially in the first few days. On the first day, very little was actually seeded, right? So none of the blueprints, the only blueprint that was seeded was, I think, the industrial core for the porpoise. And none of the skill books were seeded. And then on day two, the BPOs were seeded, but the skill books still weren't. And that actually got my attention because it doesn't actually say that the skill books would be seeded. And the skill books were actually available earlier in the, uh, during the previous event that just led up to this, where if you brought or data fragments to or facilities in NullSec, you could get these compression skill books early. And so suddenly people needed these skill books, but they weren't available anymore. So the people that did do that, they they had a captured market for about two or three days. Yeah. From my understanding that now the skill books are available, but I don't know the details of what it takes to get them now. Yeah, I think Kenneth gave out a warning saying if you're buying them now, you're you're paying a high price because it was a captured market. They would become cheaper over time, and he warned people about that. But has the first mover advantage on that been significant enough to make it worth it? I haven't looked at the volumes that were moved, but... It's always it's always desirable to get the items first to sell first because there's uh, people will pay premiums just to get into it quicker. Right. Well, there's Time two ways money. of that because there is when when the event first started. So the very first skill books that came out, this was like a couple of weeks before the compression change even started. But then, like I said, on Wednesday, we suddenly had all of the stuff but none of the skill books for people to get. So there's actually a second huge, like much larger spike of price at that time. Yeah, for me, the, the patch rollout, it was like, yay, exciting, battleship changes and compression. Oh, yeah. I, I, I know our, my, my inexplicable group of miners, I, I refer to them as inexplicable just because I can't explain <laughs> you can't why, understand why. Except that, that they, they say, yes, but we turn these minerals into Lashax, and you like Lashax. And then I'm like, oh, yes, you make an excellent point. They're very excited about compression be extending, being extended to triglavian ores just because it is very difficult to move anything in and out of Pochvin in any, you know, in, in large quantity. Wormholes have an absolute maximum mass. The largest ship that you can move out of a Pochvin wormhole is a bowhead. That's it. So, so compression, you know, we're hoping makes makes Pochman mining more viable. That means, mm -hmm. you know, bringing hopefully more mining ships in, which will make our PV our, our bloodthirsty PVPers very happy because then there's more things to hunt and uh, more defense fleets, and and hopefully that brings you know even more content to Pochman. But I sort of like it was sort of like the classic Eve the Eve experience right this this whole week there's this new new mining things which is like sort of yay but then they forgot to see the market which is uh, classic and then you know some people managed to get their hands on a on a hugely temporarily valuable resource which they then exploited the hell out of which it, if that doesn't just like sum up the entire eve experience i don't know what does a couple other notes about the mining and potchman thing first of all uh, the Pochvin ore actually has a pretty good amount of the minerals that are normally only found in low sec. So the mineral, the ore themselves in Pochvin is 
pretty darn valuable. But on the contrary, there are no structures in Pochfin, which means that the only, you would have to refine at an MPC rate at best, unless you can extract it out. Uh, there so, are there are actual actually numerous structures in that's Pochfin. That's right. You can't anchor new structures in Pochfin, correct, so it's an increasingly uh, dwindling resource. My bad. Yes. Thank you for the correction. Yeah, yeah, no, and I just say that to be fair because there are some groups that do have refining structures in particular in Pochfin. Not, it's a solid point because many. a lot of people thought that there are no more structures because, well, actually, Strybog made a pretty big point of destroying their structures. And so a lot of people now think that all of the structures got destroyed, but that's right. not true. Right. That, yeah, that is, that is not true. There are a, a handful of them. Not all of them are open to the public. And that's one thing that we have asked, you know, CSM members to, you know, petition CCP for is... It would be nice if, okay, if you don't want new, all new Citadels coming in, okay, I get it. But it would be nice if then the NPC stations that were in there had rates that were, you know, at least at least low sec or null sec, you know, rates, if not like the best rates in the game, at least something closer to, you know, to make them usable as NPC stations. But if not, then, you know, you're, you're stuck trying to haul those, those materials out and, and make use of them somewhere else. I mean, but do you think that's kind of a design has to be a sink? Because you you were saying earlier that Poch is pretty much for higher end game players, more capitalized. So I think they're going to keep the taxes up there high just to get ISK out of the economy. Well, it, except that it doesn't actually get ISK out of the economy on the on the manufacturing side, because what happens is it's it's more it, it's easier and more profitable to manufacture literally anywhere else. So that's where you do it. It, you, it doesn't so in other words it's not you know taxing industry that's there it's just it's preventing industry from happening at all yeah this is actually a pretty serious problem because like you know ccp's put a lot of advantages on structures not just taxes right so without without player clone base you no longer can get the whole like i can switch my clone without triggering the timer thing without Yep. Refining sections, then your refinement is like 20% less effective or, or more, depending on how you set up your refinement thing. With your industry thing, everything costs a bunch more and takes more time, depending on what kind of rig you have. So this is actually something that's been brought up a lot, and I agree with, which is that they need to, this is, it, it's been a problem before, but this really brings it into focus that there needs to be a standings-based stuff more in in structures such that if you were really high standings with the owner of the structures you get you know close to the same as a player structure because uh, you know that way you yeah. know if you want people to go full native that's that would be what it would take and and that would reward everybody who has put in you know the time and effort into grinding those standings which is not a you know especially when you get up into the above you know five and six on you know some of us are, are getting close to or have actually hit 9.99 or 10 oh. triglavian standings you know over the course of a year and a half so but that would be that would be a significant reward for the natives of Pochman who have very very high standings with with the triglavians and and it would be nice if ccp would do the same thing you know for edencom for example if there was some benefit to having high edencom standings somewhere yeah, I think that this could be applied to all NPC stations because there are people that want to, you know, like I, I, I hear this all the time where people feel like they have to then progress into player structures, but they wanted to like they want to invest into like one of the corporations or one of the factions and all that sort of stuff. And so like having people be able to work really hard as an individual to gain the same benefits that that groups get through structures, I think would be totally fair. All right. So if you want to get into mining quickly, CCP, with this latest pack that they're selling, the Retriever, it's actually called the Prospector. Oh, my God. Oh, and, actually, and then, before we jump into that, I do want to actually say one last thing about the mining event, yeah. which is that uh, the most effective mining ship to use in the mining event is actually the Porpoise or the Endurance, which are both expedition frigates. And the good news is that CCP actually gives you an expert system on day one that gives everybody, even alphas, the ability to fly the porpoise and the the other one. <laughs> Not the porpoise, but the uh, prospect. My bad. The yeah. prospect and the uh, endurance. So, uh, yeah, so you can get it. Everybody can get involved and do, do a good job in the mining event. But also, 
I mean, this is a good opportunity to have to play around with these T2 ships. This is one of the really good, valuable uses of expert systems, in my opinion, where CCP can have a challenge that kind of requires a specific kind of ship, but then also temporarily allow everybody to use that ship to give even alphas an ability to play with some of these more uh, powerful ships. The good example of this was like during the Grand Prix, they let everybody have interceptors. Right. I remember that. They want people to get involved. And I heard that if you give your ore to Ashtarothi, he will double it. <laughs> <laughs> he'll put Just it in he'll put it in a hangar and save it to pay you guys right. back. Right. Little right. By little. I heard it here first. Because people come and go. So, of all of the accusations I've ever heard about me, by the way, my favorite is I got told that I force people to gank in a mar so that way I can pay my miners <laughs> for their ore. I always thought that was amazing. That's pretty fun. That, yeah, that's, that's, that sounds that sounds pretty amusing. It's, yeah. This my my like favorite recruiting. criticism came from, you know, noted noted Eve, unique personality Zanuria, who said that who said that Strybog Clade is the phylactery for my self destructive tendency, which I thought was like the most amazing criticism that I've ever heard, <laughs> and it also has spawned like a month of phylactery memes and my official title in, in game and is now Lich Queen of Pacha, which we have just embraced. We have embraced the meme. So if you see, if you see a ship flying around that's named phylactery, that's me. He's got a way with words. He, he, he truly does. He truly yeah. does. You cannot yeah. kill that which is dead. <laughs> yes. I will live forever in a phylactery as a lich. Well, I mean, I'm already a lawyer in real life, so is a lich really that that much you're of a stretch? All, I don't think you're so. already undead, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Traded in my soul at the first day when I enrolled into law school. Like, well, I mean, <laughs> let's just go full undead at this point. Why not? <laughs> all right. So, uh, mining events going on. CCP wants to get more players involved. They created a prospector pack, which you can pick up for twenty five dollars US. I don't know what it is in other countries. And it has a retriever along with it. So they give you a retriever, a fit, the skills, and 30 days of Omega game time plus 100 plex, probably to buy some, either change it in for ISK or to buy some, what do you call that, ornamental stuff. What do you guys think about this pack? It's, it's on people's minds because they are saying that it violates uh, one of the tenets of Eve. And uh, so CSM has put together uh, an open letter and gone public with a caution to stop this sale and to prevent all other sales like this in the future. Uh, let's go around the board. This is what Uriel is here for. But, but first, we're going to start with Sahara, who who has the perspective on um, what it is that is troubling about this pack. Yeah, so, yeah, thank you. I, my first reaction was that I found it troubling, but also not surprising. And I do think that this is, this is CCP sort of crossing a line that doesn't feel like it has been crossed before. For, you know, and, and I'm speaking as someone who has only, only been playing this game for five years, which makes me a, you know, pretty Junior. much a newbie compared to, you know, compared to most other you know, long-term Eve players that have been playing much, much longer. But I, I came in already. I started playing at the fall of 2017. So right around the time that the alpha program, you know, first launched. And skill injectors were already a thing. So a, a lot of the things, I, I sort of like roll my eyes when, you know, the bitters to the bitter vets say, oh, this is the thing that ruined Eve. And I mean, things have been ruining Eve for, you know, years and years before I, before I even showed up. So from my perspective, it's really true. Like where, wherever you start, that's what you think Eve should be, right? That's, that's kind of your, your frame framework for how you sort of perceive and understand the game. So in some ways, you know, part of me is always thinking, okay, is this, is this just me, you know, turning into a bitter vet and shriveling my heart, shriveling into, into a little piece of, of, you know, rock hard uh, stone and, and me I just be a hater. Am I the one out of touch? No, it is the children who are wrong. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, I'm a principal skinnering my way through. I'm not sure. You know, I always have to ask myself, okay, is this me just being a you know bitter, bitter vet, or is there really a problem here? 
I think in, in this, in this case, it, it's, it's a sign of a problem. I don't, I don't like it. And I don't, I don't think it's, I, I really hope that CCP does not continue down this path with more, more things that are like it. Like, where do you, I mean, okay. There's already things in the game that where they hand out free ships, right? You go through the new player experience. They're going to hand, I, I was, I started out as an Amar on Sahara Jackal. So they handed me a, an, a, 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 a magnate, right? They handed me a coercer. I can't even remember all the little frigates that, you know, they had, they hand you your very first venture. Nobody, you know, nobody buys ventures. Nobody pays for, you know, ventures. And when you start out, you, you get one for free. You go through all of the profession little missions and they sort of teach you, you know, here's how you mine rocks. Here's how you deliver things from, you know, place to place. Here's how you do exploration. So that's, that's already there. So to the extent that CCP is like, here's, you can buy something that will let you not have to buy it from other players in game, but you can just have it. Okay. That, you know, that, that there's a, there's already, you know, that, that already exists, but I worry, where do you stop? Okay. So you stop here with, with this mining ship. All right. That's one thing. Is the, is the next pack going to be, you know, destroyers? Is the next pack after that going to be actually the previous pack was destroyers. Oh yeah. Previous pack. Yeah. So where, like, where do you (laughs) stop? Like where, where do you stop? Is it battleships? Is there going to be a, you know, buy a battleship? I think, you know, the horror that everybody's thinking is, okay, what happens, you know, to the, let's take it to the extreme. So I spend 200 us dollars and now I can get myself a free Titan pilot with a Titan. You know, or or a thousand dollars. Like, is this is this literally a pay to win? Um, you can that, buy a Titan pilot cheaper than that, but yeah. Uh, prob- yeah, probably. You know, and there there you go. There's there's the discussion, right? Okay, well, you can can you buy a Titan pilot all already for that? Yeah, or who are you paying? Are you paying the player? Are you playing CCP? CCP? You know, how do you you know how do you how how do you justify that with what's already out there versus you know what CCP wants to do? I I, I agree with the. CSM letter that you know they they are concerned about this kind of going down that monetization. On the other hand, monetization in video games it it has always been controversial, but I think it's past to the point of being recognized as a as a thing that just exists as a standard part of the industry now. So you're concerned about the the creep that this may be okay because it's small, but Right. This this is going to lead to the biggest, most valuable ships in the game being sold directly, and that troubles you. It it does. I mean, we all know, like we all know about gotcha games, you know, phone games and things like that that really thrive on. They make the game game kind of unpleasant to play, and then you can get past the unpleasantness by simply paying for, you know, more. Isn't that like the the classic example of this Candy Crush, right? The, the one that sort of, you know, the, the big, you know, the big casual game that, you know, raked in uh, obscene amounts of money. So, so yeah, it's kind of a pain in the butt to play and it kind of artificially limits your ability to play as long as you want to um, by limiting how long you can play or how many turns you can do. And then you can buy your way into more, more fun by through all these ma- microtransactions. So in, in some ways, I mean, if you're honest with yourself, you're looking at EVE Online and going, wow. EVE Online is a game that has a lot of pain in the ass mechanics. And if, if CCP found a way to like monetize that and say, oh, you can skip the wait time on, you know, researching this blueprint by paying $25. I mean, holy shit, that would transform the game in a way. Then they would right? design the game to be even more of a pain. Right, right. <laughs> right. In some ways, it's already set up it to, to, you know, maximize profits that way. If you could, you know, so many things that if you could pay your way out of having to deal with them, I think there are a sizable number of people who would. So a couple things to to point out on the go. First of all, EVE Online is and has been for a long time pay to win insofar as you can pay real life money to progress and to advance in the game. Pay to win is a concept. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that you absolutely win when you pay. It just simply means that your real life resources directly equates to how powerful you are in the game in some way rather than having the game solely you know your progress in the game solely be based on your own efforts so yeah the game is absolutely pay to win and it has been for some time 
The other thing to think about is the fact that game development is extremely expensive and it's only become more expensive over time and to the point where, but at the same time, the player base has refused to increase like how much they're willing to pay for a game, which creates this interesting problem in game design where uh, they need to figure out a way to allow those who are willing to spend a lot of money to augment uh, the people who aren't, i.e. whales. And so in a free-to-play game, strictly free-to-play game, in which everything is accessible no matter what, even when you're free, you get an interesting, or you get a problem where it is incentivized for the developers to put arbitrary blockers in your place such that they can then sell you the solution to those problems. EVE Online has a minor protection against that in the fact that EVE Online is still predominantly a subscription-based game with a robust trial system. As long as it remains a, a, a subscription-based game, then it is in CCP's investment to, to make sure that people remain in the game and continue to pay their sub. I mean, it, it's in their interest. <clears throat> that's what they're in. That's what they're. You said investment. Uh, that's all. Yeah, you're right. You're right. They're, you get uh, their motivation. Yeah. They're. It's in their interest. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ariel, you're uh, first. Tell us a Ooh, little bit. I'm about stuff. to get roasted. I know you've been quiet <laughs> for a long time. Uh, you've been quiet okay. for a long time, and we've been talking. We talked yesterday. There's a special one hour of us talking, and there's. But I want to say that this is something you're familiar with. But anyway, go ahead and tell us what your take is on it. Well, my take is from the CCP side is for the economics of this, the only way I can compare it to the real world is the current state of states in the U.S. and wealth re redistribution. It's the same problem. How do I keep the people who are willing to be here paying higher tax rates? And how do I meet the needs of everyone else who is here? And that's what they're trying to address with this is how do I get people who are willing to pay for more for a different premium? to stay in the game, but still provide a game that anyone can come in, start an alpha account and get going. And it's a fair trade off to me, especially looking at the price of like this pack, right? Really, what are you paying for the ship? Five bucks after the hundred plex and 30 days Omega. So it's not like, I, I don't have an issue with that. I don't think it's a problem, especially when I look at how flat ISK is in velocity and looking at the production. And then looking at the reaction of markets with the retriever, it just kind of tells me that there wasn't a huge market there making these things and sending it out. So nobody's getting cut out by this. Okay, yeah. One of the, I mean, there's a few things that have been criticisms of this. I've seen it's, it's bad for people who are making retrievers. You know, their, their retriever farm is going to diminish that it cuts out game loops, that the player-made economy is a, f a fundamental thing in EVE Online, which it is, but it's not ever been a player-made economy fully. There's always been NPCs. PI used to be all NPC stuff that you bought. Blue loot now, you sell to NPC vendors. And so most of the economy is player-made, but I think they've been I don't know, chiseling away at that. Not chiseling away, they've been opening up more, but they have actually undermined the economy in more significant ways than this. But I, I'm trying not to get involved. Uh, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> well, it's hard because there is no good way to establish systems of trust in EVE right now. You couldn't do an actual open financial exchange with price discovery and all those things that we figured out in the real world a long time ago. So it's going to be hindered by that for a while. Yeah. Ash, what do you think about game development here? Like, is this as simple as we want more people to participate? So let's get them in the right retriever? in the action. Yeah. Because, I mean, if you uh, buy a retriever, you get to, like, I imagine you get to pop it up wherever you are. If you're in a wormhole, boom, instant retriever in a wormhole. You didn't need to transport it there. It's there. Like, there's some, there's some magic here. but. It will get you into a retriever in a wormhole mining like pretty quickly. Right. Well, there's two 
reasons that I've been able to guess. I don't, I, I haven't defined their real thing. I haven't gotten a chance to get a confirmation from the CCP about any of this. But the two reasons I see is, like you said, the ability to have a retriever where you, you know, without having to bring, transport it there or build it. But also the idea that, like, it comes with a fit and therefore, like, it, the problem is, is that the game doesn't teach people how to fit ships effectively. And so, you know, historically, they have just given you plex and maybe a skin or something like that to be, be a pack. But it's very likely that their metrics show that people are, have difficulty transferring that plex into the thing that they want. And therefore, this kind of closes that loop and just lets them see and give them, like, you want to mine? Here's the ship to do it without also having to explain to them what how to get this ship. Can so, they'll figure it out if they get into the ship and they get out there. They're going to figure out how to mine. Right. Yeah, Can they I have comment? an example of what, yeah. it looks like, what it looks like. Can I comment on something that Asherothi yeah. just said, which I think is extremely, extremely important? He said, I'm guessing that, you know, what CCP is, you know, what their justification is, and then, you know, went on to explain. For me, I think that is a huge part of the problem. We are all guessing what CCP was thinking when they decided to make this available, and we have no idea whether we're right or not. So I, what I see is so a lot of people who are quite you know, anti-CCP, or I don't, maybe not anti-CCP, but very skeptical of CCP, ascribing a lot of very Motivation. hostile intentions and motivations behind them. Oh, this is a straight yeah. money grab. Oh, this is ruining the game. Oh, they're killing the cash game. Whatever. Well, those are all trigger words, aren't they? Right, right. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, CCP apologists, and I don't mean that in any pejorative way. I mean that in you know the sense of apologia, you know, the actual, you know, apologist who who say, well, this is what they could be thinking, or they or they they may have had you know metrics that said this. I don't know if they had metrics there or not. I have no idea if they, you know, how much reasoned decision making this was. Was that reasoned decision making? What would be really helpful is for a community manager or somebody to to have, you know, paper this for the community and say, look, here's what we did. We made this decision because we think this will do X. Do you really do think that will help? I, I think it will because lack of communication. Would that convince you? Do you think it would convince critics? It would. I don't know if it would convince or not, but it would at least indicate that somebody in CCP was thinking about the consequences of their actions. And since that is a major bone of contention in this whole thing, that would solve at least one problem. Now you can argue about it on the merits, but it takes away that, that whole CCP is a brain dead company that doesn't know what it's doing and is ruining the game I argument, right? Just I don't think you take it away. I don't, I don't think you take that away. Either. In <laughs> absence of an official explanation, people can just project whatever they want. Now, if they give an official, uh, it's explanation, dismissed. It's dismissed. Yeah, they, could, they could easily just say, "Oh, CCP's lying," but that's a different argument. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. Well, I mean, if we get to the core of it, right, they want to make a change. Change comes with pain and confusion and uncertainty. And that's what just happened. A change happened and people are going to react that way no matter how you try to reply with, to it, no matter how you try to explain it. Right. I, all I know is that, and it, this is for any organization, this is for your real life, your job, any, any organization, you know, recreational or professional that you belong in, an organization that communicates important information to its member constituency in a timely and regular manner is always more trusted than one that does not. And so to the extent that there is a lack of trust between the player base and CCP, that one of the solutions that they should, that they should come up with is more transparency and more communication. Just give us something that indicates I, somebody out there cares. I get it, but I think in this case, it was kind of undermined with the CSM letter. Yeah, I agree. I don't think they could recover and come out with an open front, hey, here's our reply to this, why we're doing this, when the CSM took it as a... I, I'm not accusing them of something. I'm just saying what I see it as, an attempt to build up political capital to try and get the changes they want. I saw a lot of frustration in that CSM letter from a CSM that 
is that has indicated they are ready and willing to listen and are interested in what CCP wants to do and keeps getting caught by surprise with changes and policy and, and policy updates that were well, never do you even think, previewed before the CSM. Uh, this is one of two things that would have happened if CSM had been told, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're putting out there. CSM right. would have said, we advise against that. Right. But in, in this case, it sounds to me like CSM wasn't even notified. It just dropped. That happens with a lot of stuff, especially marketing. Although CSM right. will be meeting with marketing on Tuesday, probably to say, hey, tisk tisk, you know, this this is something that you touch that really you shouldn't have because this, this is what the player concerns are and all that. Now, do you trust CSM to be the ones at the table talking to CCP about this? They're the That's ones to- that, that volunteered to do that job that the player base elected specifically to do that job. So if they you know, if they aren't doing their job, then we need to replace them. But there are people on that. We, we on can't the replace CSM. the CSM. The CSM are baked yeah. in. Like, no, 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 no. We not, can't. We replace not, them every not year. If not them, then who? That's we the question. Them. No, we, 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 replace, we, replace, we replace the faces. The seats remain co-opted, though. I mean, CSM is not a democratic system. It's not well, one it, vote it, for one person. What? No, no, it is democratic. It's not one vote it's for one person. It's, it's not one no, no, vote per person. I'm saying it's democratic to the fault of mob rule. No, you actually have 300 votes if you have 300 accounts. It's not one right. vote. One of the, per- one of the oh, criticisms okay, that's saying, been yeah. levied in the last two ex- CSMs in particular is the fact that there are, in fact, individuals that have like the voting power of entire alliances. It's, it's basically a pay-to-win system, if you think about it, right? If you are paying either through Plex or through real money, multiple accounts, you have multiple times the amount of CSM voting power as a person who plays the game with one account. I I get that. But on the other hand, you also have multiple (laughs) invested, you know, over one person who only has one account invested. So, I mean, that, that cuts both ways, but Matt, yeah, I see, I see your point, Matt, but I think, I, I think you're, I think that's a too cynical take on the CSM. I I think that's too cynical. Honestly, I think the most important Uh, question to ask here is how many votes does Ash buy with the Plex he got? (laughs) 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 Right. I, I'll announce it right now. I am not running for the CSM. Yeah, it's charity or CSM. Where are you going to put your money? I know where the good use is. Oh, I'm I'm with I'm with Ash on that one. You could not pay me to be on the CSM. There's no. Yeah, I mean, if, if you want to be if you want to be a second layer of quality control, go ahead. You know, I I'd rather do the real job. I get the feeling that CSM, or sorry, the CCP knows my feelings on most things without me having to be on the CSM. (laughs) Well, I think that's the reason that media talks about this so much. It's what bothers me about this is just how how these are just cause celebs, right? I mean, this (laughs) this sail ship this sail this ship sailed a long time ago. This is this is the child of 2011. You wanted. The people at the time were writing about, you know, we want a game that's not broken. We want a game that has balance and that changes it up on us and that sort of thing. We want more people playing the PvP part of the game. And, uh, you know, let's have more of an arcade game. Let's have less of a sim. You made that decision in 2011, whether you knew it or not. CCP looked at the realities of the gaming world now. And they're saying, yeah, that's what's competitive. So we'll go in that direction. That's what's going to keep us afloat. Whatever. That's what, again, I'm ascribing what they might be thinking strategically, but mostly the, the pressure that players put on the company through media is this is the natural result of that. You want to go arcade? Here it is. Get people in, play the game. You want to go sim? That was left on the table in 2011. Now it's a whole different thing. Now you're talking about an economy. Now you're talking about relationships and that sort of stuff. And I think you know, we're way past that. So for me, people getting offended about this kind of makes me laugh, but it also makes me offended by the offense. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is not the issue to be fighting about. It seems like it because people tell you it is. But the real issue is that the game is becoming more of an arcane pew, pew, pew game. Unless you play the game and then none of this matters. That's that's my new opinion about EVE Online. If you play EVE and you don't listen to any of this media stuff that we do and that other people do, you're going to have a better life, my opinion. That's Ignorance what I do. Blessed, right? 
That's what you do, Uriel, which is one of my new favorite people. That's what Sahara <laughs> does. She's one of my new favorite people. That's what Ash has done for a long time, although he also does media stuff. All right, well, yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's, that's where I've, I've settled my whole, you know, my piece with, uh, with the game. Play the game, enjoy I, the game, play with friends, ignore all this media stuff. I do want to say that the distinction that I think is really important here is the fact that the act of getting a retriever stimulates a whole bunch of other processes, right? Like somebody has to mine the ore, somebody has to get the blueprint from Outer Ring Excavation and you know research it. Somebody has to use that to build the retriever. Somebody has to get it to market. So by allowing, by circumventing that and creating this out of nowhere, I actually don't think that the real issue of it is even necessarily the effect of retrievers on the market or anything like that. It is suppressing act one type of activity for another type of activity. And that kind of sucks because logistics is just as important of an aspect of the game. And I don't like to see it disrespected. Disrespected every day with ganking. Come on. It's like logistics it's is disrespected the, like, the whole all thing. the time. Like, no, no, no. That's the gameplay. Like being able to deal with all those kinds of things, being able to, you know, handle Yuidama, being able, you know, ha uh, designing your solutions to these problems. That's the whole game. So now somebody to the, to those people. So now somebody's done all of that, and then their their work gets circumvented because somebody else, you know, the person just buys it from CCP instead. Yeah. All right. Let's go into final thoughts on this. We'll start with Uriel. I don't think this will really even be talked about in a week. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly, I think people find a new thing to be raging against, and ultimately, no, I don't think it'll matter. Sarah, my final thought is, I I think this is a troubling sign, and uh, I'm concerned about about where things are going from here. Ash, I think that this is a fundamental change in the game, as per in the same vein as like the in introduction of skill injectors and the introduction of abyss and introduction of selling skill points for, for cash. That said, all of those things did not destroy the game and some of them made them better and allowed us to challenge false assumptions. We're just going to have to wait and see a, whether or not this becomes a more regular thing and B what its practical effects are. Yeah. And, with Uriel on this, except it will be remembered because people, again, have a lot of interest in running in front of parades and acting like they're leaders. Like, you know, whatever you think is popular, if you're going to run in front of that, you set yourself up for success so that you can gain some kind of personal, some personal advantage of being right on issues. That to me is what, you know, is the, is the, is the engine behind the outrage, in my opinion. Sure, some people are concerned about it. It's not going to affect you, not in the slightest, not even close compared to all the stuff that's affected you before. And this is what you want to get mad about? Again, I think this is a big uh, to-do about nothing. And even if they were to stretch it, whatever, whichever direction they stretch it, this is the way the game has been going. People in space doing things. And this little pack for 25 bucks gets you in space doing that thing. I don't think it's just new players that are going to buy this. It's going to be players that are like, yeah, I want to dabble in that. I'm, a, I'm an older man, which EVE Online players have. Plenty of. I have more money than I have time. Just inject me into that gameplay. I don't think it's a win formula. I think that's what it is. And it's not any kind of a principle. I think your principles are totally... It's like worrying about if you're wearing gloves in a snowstorm when you're not wearing a jacket or pants or anything else. Like your principle of gloves just going to uh, be meaningless because you haven't really fought the fight, you know, for the soul of the game as a sim. Don't worry about the sim now. You're way past that. This is an arcade game and you guys want it that way. So there you go. Uh, Did you hear that the uh, CSM is upset that uh, they wanted to manufacture outrage, but it turns out CCP sold it in their next pack? 
<laughs> yes. For that was a joke. That was a joke, everyone. Every pack comes with Please one unit of salt. That's, that's the player. That's the player economy these days. It's it's manufacturing outrage, right? That's how you know There's that CC Falcon's no longer the community manager because that would have absolutely happened. <laughs> yeah. Player made economy, manufacture outrage at every step. Good lord. The manufactured uh, outrage until CCP decided to sell it for five ninety nine. Yeah, until they, until they undercut you and sell it. I love that. All right. That's all that we have today. I want to point out a few things. Two years ago, COVID shut down schools in my area, Los Angeles. And so we're going to look back on, not look back, but mention that two years ago we did... Uh, Quarantine and stations. We did episodes talking about COVID when it was first happening, and <clears throat> we did about four or five episodes, three or four. And then we did a, a review last year about this same time. We won't do one this year, but I just want to look back and thank Tiberius and Lula, two people in the medical industry who walked us through a lot of the information that helped a lot of people understand what was going on while it was happening. Those are the shows I'm most proud of in all these uh, years at Talking in Stations, doing shows on a pandemic as it was happening is was just illustrative of what we put together as a group you know with talking in stations and talking to players all over the world two is the other anniversary it's happening today that was an anniversary today is this is six years of talking in stations so we've been at this for six years i want to thank uh, my good friend dirk mcgurk I want to thank Caleb. I want to thank Ash Jarathi. These are the original guys that give me the juice to do these things. And I also want to thank the backbone of TIS as it continues will be Artemis, who's engineering today. So six years of Talking in Stations. I want to thank everybody that's ever been on Talking in Stations for putting together and bringing their best, bringing their content, you know, what they know about EVE Online. It's, uh, it's been an amazing run at six years. For me, this will be my last show as host of Talking in Stations. This is being handed over to Rain, who will take over as Talking in Stations center seat. She will be the creative control, and uh, Artemis will continue as CEO and overall caretaker of the entire operation. I'm going to disappear for a while. I will be playing EVE Online. I will be, as I always have. I hope. My cat's interrupting my soliloquy. And I will be around playing the game and actually enjoying uh, the game and probably not listening to the media as much as I did before. But I want to thank everybody who's ever watched Talking in Stations, especially our Patreons who did more than watch us. They actually supported us and kept us motivated and bought us equipment, bought us subscriptions, the software that we used. And those guys are the ones that you should thank for talking in stations, continuing for as long as it has. So this is the end of our sixth year. This is the end of uh, Matterall as talking in stations. And this is the beginning of Rain and Artemis and other people that will continue. The rain of rain. I like that, <laughs> right? It's kind of, it sounds good. So thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. We will see you next time, next week, with Rain on Talking in Stations.